Good afternoon and welcome to the Energy Policy Seminar. Uh, I'm Henry Lee, I'm the Director of the Environment and Natural Resource Program at the Kennedy School, one of the sponsors of this seminar, along with the Mosova Romani Center for Business and Government, the Belfer Center, and the Harvard University Center for the Environment. Uh, let me open with a few reminders uh, regarding the logistics of the seminar. Uh, we are recording it and we'll post it on the seminar series website. So if you have a friend or a colleague who misses this talk, uh, please let them know they can watch it later. Uh, and we also have registration links for the next few seminars. And I would remind you that next Monday is Columbus Day or Indigenous Peoples Day. Uh, and uh, there will be no seminar on that day since the school is closed. Um, we are going to take questions through the Q&A function in Zoom. So please click on Q&A at the bottom of your screen and type your questions and I will then uh, ask uh, our guest. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to now introduce uh, Judy Chang. Uh, she's no stranger to these seminars. Uh, she has uh, participated in different incarnations. Uh, she now um, is the undersecretary uh, uh, of Energy and Climate Solutions for the state of Massachusetts. Uh, she leads the state's efforts in setting policies across energy sectors, working with agencies and aligning strategies and plans for decarbonization and climate mitigation. In better words, she's the climate czar. Uh, she's an energy economist and a policy expert with a, with a background in electrical engineering and prior to joining uh, the Massachusetts Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs, uh, she uh, co-led the energy practice at the Brattle Group. And she's also the founding board member of the New England Women in Energy and the Environment. Judy, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Um, what Professor Lee didn't say is that I'm also a MPP graduate. Uh, from the Kennedy School. <laughs> and uh, many years ago, I knocked on Professor Lee's door and said, please help me with my career choices and uh, share with me how, you know, how to navigate this world. So, um, so of course, Kennedy School is still uh, really close to my heart. Um, I'm still working in the Boston area, although today I'm talking to you from my home office. Uh, some of my closest friends, uh, I actually, I should say my cohort friends from MPP classes are still some of my closest friends today. So uh, we still get together regularly to talk about policies and uh, we're all in different policy arenas now. So the exchanges of, you know, working between private sector, public sector, NGO and other uh, and, and the debates we have are very similar to the ones we had in the classrooms, just with probably a lot more uh, drinks and food <laughs> than when we, were, when we were students. So today I'm going to talk a bit about um, decarbonization efforts at the state level. And I should just preface by saying it's a very, very rich topic. Uh, decarbonization in general is a rich topic, but even at the just at the state level, it's a very rich topic. And um, I'm going to spend some time with you to just describe to you sort of a descriptive way of talking about what I'm working on and what our office is working on, what the state is working on. But most important to me is actually your questions um, and how we, you know, I'm gonna try my best using Zoom and this webinar format to have a dialogue because I am very curious how you think about the question, but uh, think of the topic, but also your questions. So I'm going to reserve plenty of time, hopefully, <laughs> to, to just share with you by um, your question and answer. So um, first I have, I have prepared, oh, okay. Um, you probably need to enable my screen sharing can't share screen, but it's okay. I, I prepared two sort of very high level policy type of um, slides. I don't know, can you, can you give me sharing capability? Okay, here we go. Okay. 
first is just a picture. Actually, both of them are just pictures. So I'm going to flip them up here and use them as a kick kickoff points. And then I'm going to talk about uh, each sector uh, of the economy and what we're trying to achieve with, with decarbonization of each sector. So this is just a picture of what we need to do to meet our 2050 commitment. Um, Massachusetts has set in law to achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. And this is a picture of how drastic that uh, drop will need to be. And also you'll see that we are anticipating we will achieve probably a gross emissions of about 15%, so 85% reduction from 1990 level with, an, uh, with that 15% being sequestered and stored. So that's sort of how we're thinking about what a net zero means. The next slide, I will use this as a kickoff point because here are the pillars of decarbonization. And pro I would guess, and I've you know, reviewed other jurisdiction studies and analyses, and I would say these are more or less uh, consistent with other either cities, states, or provinces, or countries, or really internationally, how we think about the components of decarbonization. So I'm going to talk about each one of these probably pretty quickly so that I allow uh, you all to ask questions. It's intentional I put environmental justice or energy justice in the middle because as we go through the transition to decarbonizing our economy, we have to put in the center the people and probably most importantly, the most vulnerable people, most vulnerable people. And those are people who have, um, in Massachusetts, we're called environmental justice communities. They're typically in lower income brackets and in locations that traditionally have borne more of the burden of environmental damages as well as uh, energy infrastructure. So in everything we do, we have to think about environmental justice going forward and how the impact of the changes we're, we're taking on would not unfairly affect those that are most vulnerable. And then around it are some of the sort of sectoral bases of, an, uh, of approaches. Well, I'm gonna start with buildings and go almost counterclockwise. Uh, buildings, we are working with uh, all of the agencies to talk about how we decarbonize the use of energy in our buildings. And really in Massachusetts, because of the climate uh, we have here, really what that means uh, first and foremost is trying to get carbon emissions out of heating. Um, while I want to talk to you, maybe I could just stop sharing that way. Um, I will maybe pop this back on later. Um, so using the building sector, we're trying to figure out how to decarbonize heating the most. And uh, most recently, Governor Baker just signed a new executive order where we're con con convening a commission for clean heat, where a committee of people from all walks of life around the heating sector We'll, we'll discuss how to cap the emissions from the heating of buildings. And um, that of course has a lot of challenges. And, and the last time I spoke to the Kennedy School crowd, uh, people asked, you know, what can we do? What can each person do? And I think this is where we really individually can make a lot of difference in making choices in our heating choices. So what that means is the next time we have to replace a boiler, uh, or even, you know, adding an air conditioner, we need to think about what kind of appliance we uh, buy and operate. So at the state level, we're working with the utilities and all the policymakers and the program developers to figure out a way to create incentives for people who own buildings and operate buildings to reduce the energy consumption, which means energy efficiency, First and foremost, increase efficiency of our buildings, both existing and new, 
and then to reduce the energy necessary and, and make sure that we start transitioning the heating of our buildings from fossil fuel to electricity. The next sector is transportation. Similarly with buildings, we are um, advancing clean transportation initiatives, primarily through electrification. So the, the state already have the state, uh, Massachusetts already has significant incentives along with federal incentives to encourage people to purchase your next vehicle, an electric vehicle. And you ask, okay, so we're basically electrifying buildings and electrifying um, transportation. And then the next, uh, uh, you know, simultaneously what we're doing is trying to get the emissions out of the electricity sector by transforming and transitioning from, uh, in Massachusetts, we've already transitioned away from coal plants, uh, coal power plants. So we've already um, brought, basically our electricity is provided by large hydro facilities, nuclear and natural gas. So we're gradually going to uh, transition the old oil generator generators to uh, and the natural gas generators to renewable generation. The states already have in place renewable energy portfolio standards, just like many other states. And through that, we have found um, you know those programs in a you know in a deregulated states actually faces some challenges. So now we have new legislation to uh, give authority to the state to procure through our utilities, long-term contracts with renewable generation, including offshore wind. So one of the largest pushes that we're um, approaching now is how to uh, incent create the proper incentives through contracts, but also how do we build an economy around offshore wind? Massachusetts will have one of the first uh, offshore wind farms in the United States, utility scale. And we have a contracted 1600 megawatts and another 1600 megawatts are under procurement. So those are sort of the three pillars, um, starting with the building sector, transportation sector, and the electricity system. So, um, I think I wanna talk a little bit about the challenges of doing these things. It sounds like, okay, you kind of figured it out. You wanna electrify these buildings and transportation and put it on a clean grid. But it turns out it's a sort of an economy-wide transformation. This is not a, you know, uh, while we work sector by sector, we work on the issues sector by sector, this is really a economy-wide transformation. And this means that we need to create an environment where consumers are actually going to change the way they use energy and the type of energy they use. So for example, we need a situation where we create markets and scale up the, the demand and the supply of clean transportation and clean heating solutions. And that itself is not easy. One of the things that we're actually analyzing is um, as, you know, one of probably the most challenging thing, okay, all of these things are very challenging, but one of the most challenging things is how to decarbonize buildings and the heating of buildings. Uh, I would say about 50%, about half of our buildings in Massachusetts are heated by, by natural gas. And in the less urban areas, uh, our buildings are still using oil and propane in some cases and some biomass as well. So to decarbonize heating of the buildings, the not easy to accomplish, but the, prop, the lowest hanging fruit is actually try to transition our oil heated buildings to electric heat pumps. And that itself not only costs money, but also uh, need a significant amount of education and market building, we need to we need to we need to have a market that actually you know consumers actually know about uh, how heat pumps are being used, what what benefits they can provide. We need to encourage um, a workforce to be developed 
so that we have actually in, enough installers. So that's what I mean by an economy-wide transition. And similarly, I'll just take another example. Uh, offshore wind, it seems simple to talk about states procuring an offshore wind portfolio and developing uh, a transition to using more renewable through offshore wind. It turns out um, developing offshore wind is not very simple. It has significant environmental impact that we have not looked at in the past. How, so essentially we need to co we need to create an environment where offshore wind industry develops in coexistence with all our other offshore and marine um, life and businesses. So we need to create a situation where our fishing industry can coexist as we develop the offshore wind industry. And how do we develop an offshore wind industry? Uh, with the amount of offshore development, offshore wind development targeted for United States, we really cannot have an offshore, real offshore wind industry in this country until we have our domestic manufacturing. And we can't really have domestic manufacturing and installation until we have a workforce that can deliver these projects. So most of these uh, decarbonization, decarbonization effort, including developing an offshore wind industry, is actually about developing an entire industry holistically, working with workforce, making sure we have a plan to, to train the workforce of the future, to make sure that we can develop a plan that the offshore wind industry can coexist with our marine uh, life, uh, the existing marine life, and have minimized the uh, impact on our environmental uh, marine environment and coexist with our fishing industries. So um, that's that's one level of thinking about this. In addition, the state must work with federal government as well, not only for resources. So of course, we rely on federal government for some resources, uh, particularly focusing on infrastructure, uh, and, such as offshore wind development, uh, electrifying our transportation infrastructure by increasing charging uh, stations, those kind of um, activities require the states to work with our federal partners. But we also need to work with our federal partners in thinking about structuring the entire economy of the future. So I'll give you an example using the electricity sector. The state has very little jurisdiction in some ways about how the electricity sector is developing and will develop and how we transform our electrical system to adopt these new offshore wind um, technologies, where most of our transmission infrastructure as well as the markets where electricity is participating are um, under the jurisdiction of federal government. So we actually need to work with our Federal Energy Regulatory Commission to redesign the entire market, uh, thinking about how our electricity, wholesale electricity market operates and how we can advance transmission infrastructure that we will need to deliver offshore wind, a uh, hydro facility, a uh, hydro infrastructure, um, and large hydro imports from Canada, and onshore winds and onshore solar, of course. So all of these things are actually have to occur simultaneously. So the states are actually, including Massachusetts, working very closely with our federal partners on all of these topics. Um, lastly, uh, I think just as important, Massachusetts is in a unique situation where we're also looking at our natural working lands to understand how much carbon storage or carbon capture and sequestration we can provide in the future. Remember that 15% that I showed in the first graph? Um, we anticipate that we'll get down to sort of a gross emission level of about 85% uh, reduction from 1990 level, so leaving about 15%. So we need our working and natural lands um, to absorb. We essentially need to get 
uh, capture and remove carbon emissions from our atmosphere and try to store them in our natural working lands. So we're uh, looking at analyzing how much of our land infrastructure can help uh, reduce and capture some of that carbon emissions of the future. I see some question and answer uh, Q and A uh, being filled up there, but maybe I should turn it back to Professor Lee. To I see you uh, writing some uh, notes, so perhaps we can have, start a dialogue, and I can use this opportunity to answer more questions. I was hoping I wasn't so uh, blatant about that, um, but I'm trying to take some of the questions and uh, uh, which are very good, and of course. Uh, there, uh, there's so much to talk about, uh, given the wide range of issues that you've touched on. Let me start with uh, the need to uh, approve and cite uh, uh, a lot of uh, the new cleaner technologies as we do this transition away from gas-fired power plants to renewables. Uh, uh, and we now have to think about transmission and a, and a different grid and all of this. And a lot of people get up and say, yeah, I, I'm for renewables. I think we should go with solar and wind, but not near my house, please. Um, and so you've got all of this uh, citing opposition. When we wrote the, when I was in government years ago, when we wrote the citing bill. Uh, the whole idea was to get environment as an issue that people would be sensitive to. They, they think about it. Um, and so citing, the citing process was to force the developers to improve their projects, to make them better. And environmental issues became a huge, um, at times, uh, at least some people feel in New England, sort of a bottleneck compared to where it is in some other parts of the United States. Now we want to go to renewables. And how do you deal with the people who love renewables but don't want it anywhere near them? Yeah, great question. You get right to the heart of it, right? So for us to be able to electrify much of our economy, we actually need more electricity supply and transportation of that electricity. So transmission and distribution systems. And I am now sitting uh, as part, a member of our Massachusetts Siting Board and I now witness firsthand the opposition in many of our citing topics, including some, I would say, relatively foundational infrastructure need. For example, substations. We will need transmission and distribution substations and we probably will need more of them. This is before we even get to on, you know, solar and wind that will take much more footprint. But even building just the foundational infrastructure, we are uh, going to face more and more challenges. And there's not a simple solution to this, but first I think a lot more education is needed because, you know, we cannot get to decarbonization without building more infrastructure. Second, I do think the industry needs to do a better job, in addition to education, do a better job in sort of squeezing out more capabilities out of the existing system. And we have the technologies to do that, but we don't have the incentive structure yet to do that. So I think that's one thing we're working with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission to think about how we can create incentives for transmission and distribution owners to use the best technology to basically reduce the necessary investments in the future, but actually use a, a best technology to squeeze more out of our existing technology. And then siting, I think if we can um, do a better job in identify corridors, particularly corridors that are already being used um, either through by highways or railroads or existing uh, rights of ways that are already being used for transmission and how to squeeze that, squeeze more out of that, I think we'll do a better job and ease and provide some um, uh, or simplify permitting and, and siting a, a bit better. 
But all of that is sort of the lower hanging fruit. But um, I do think uh, we, we have a big challenge ahead of us to try to build more infrastructure in a, especially in densely populated areas. Um, one thing that uh, Department of Energy and we are beginning to think about is having offshore systems. So as we build offshore wind, I know the UK is thinking about it this way. How do we start using an offshore system to avoid siting new large transmission projects onshore? So all of those things, I think we have to start thinking about. Um, and then most importantly, I think uh, education and communication. As we conduct siting and permitting of all of these infrastructure projects, whether it's renewable or transmission or distribution, we need to give a voice to those people that have not necessarily in the past participated in these siting and permitting processes. I have, um, well, maybe I should just say, I believe that if we give more voices to, uh, so that we hear the voices of those that have not traditionally participated, we would do a better job in understanding what needs to be done and what, what mitigation measures are necessary. And I think our utilities that own and build the transmission distribution systems are also learning about this. Um, I'm sure this siting is just an ever, never ending and ever increasing challenge for most infrastructure. But I think this is just something we have to deal with. I think education is still the first move. We have to um, help people understand that we won't get there without building infrastructure. All right, let me uh, segue into something you just touched on, environmental justice. Uh, you look at countries in the world that have done a lot in this transition, probably uh, Germany is always put as one of those countries. If you look at the German energy plan and you look at the German legislation, there is no word environmental justice anywhere in that legislation. Mm -hmm. Yet it's at the center of your um, component uh, uh, yes. slide. Um, what does it, what, how does the Commonwealth and how will the Commonwealth uh, implement its focus on the climate transition and uh, um, energy justice uh, or social justice? Yeah, um, I think, you know, it's easy for me to say that's at the center of everything we do, but it really has to be. Um, for example, and I can give you examples to kind of give you a flavor of this, which is, for example, when we, um, when we think about transforming transportation and try to electrify our transportation system, um, we need to think about how not only to encourage those that can afford easily uh, afford a fifty thousand dollar, you know, Tesla car to encourage those people to buy those cars, but we need to think about what kind of transportation will be available for those that typically, you know, wouldn't buy an expensive car, and they may need public transit to go to work, um, or they may. Um, prefer to have their own cars, but can't afford an electric vehicle. I think we need to think about range anxiety and think about, you know, is it, you know, those that are, first of all, uh, most charging happens about 80, 85% of charging of electric vehicle happens in the home uh, or places of work. But those that are in rental properties may not have charging available at home. And so we need to think about how to set up charging infrastructure for those that may not be in this traditional image of a home charging station. So just to taking a clean transportation initiative, we need to think about how to encourage those that are in the lower income bracket to adopt a cleaner technology. And then we need to think about, well, how do we provide charging infrastructure for those people that may not have access, direct access in naturally like some other homes. And then we need to think about 
how to encourage, for example, um, better public transit. And then most importantly, in urban areas, how do we reduce emissions, not just greenhouse gas emissions, but air pollutions from, for example, delivery trucks, right? Because the most densely populated locations are probably also experiencing more <coughs> of the traffic jams and traffic from delivery trucks. So I think this holistic way of thinking about uh, how to address clean transportation initiatives, but also focusing on the people who might be most vulnerable is the way we tend to think about most of these initiatives. So not just the simple um, you know, incentive payments for buying an electric car, but actually thinking about, well, who is actually going to adopt those cars? Who, who are the early adopters? Who can we need? Who, who will be experiencing sort of the downside of emissions if we don't transition to a clean transportation infrastructure? So I think those are sort of an example of what a holistic way of thinking about environmental justice and energy justice would look like. I think one of the big issues that you, uh, I'm hearing more and more about is the capacity to actually implement a decarbonization uh, plan within a 30 year period, which is a very short period of time. You gotta remember 30 years ago, it was 1991. And a lot of us remember 1991 is not that far in our past. Um, and you know, you've talked about all the things that you need to do, but you've also talked about the constraints, one of which is the environmental justice constraint. Uh, you talked about fishing, um, and yet you wanna go offshore, but you wanna be sure that you do not in any way compromise the fishing industry. Uh, I, you've touched on uh, making energy affordable and not making it too expensive. Uh, and then there's an issue you didn't touch on, but it's a big issue in electricity, which is reliability. We're used to a phenomenal amount of reliability. I realize that there are people in my neighborhood who do not think that um, um, you know, Eversource is always the most reliable, but it is phenomenally reliable compared to any other country you go to. Um, yeah. And so you have to build a system within those constraints. Uh, that is an enormous challenge that you've got ahead of yourself, given those constraints. If I said, all right, relax two of the four and then put together a plan, that would be much more doable. So, you know, when we've had similar things like in World War II, we had to mobilize. Uh, we, we threw all the constraints away for four years. We, uh, can we do this with the, and live within the constraint and meet a true uh, you know, 85% uh, decarbonization plus 15% sequestered? Uh, it's a, I, I like the way you asked that question. I thought you were going to talk about resource constraint, <laughs> but that is also another constraint. Um, well, I'm probably talking about we... institutional human resources and, and basically jurisdictional constraints. Um. We definitely face constraints. And these days, I guess I feel the constraints on time. <laughs> and I don't just mean my time, but like you said, we used to think 2050 is so far away. And the decarbonization analysis that Massachusetts conducted made a, made a point to transition during the end of life of equipment. And it turns out, you know, if we start buying, you know, we start to have a new car today, at most you'll have, you know, if the end of life is 10 years, you only have two more chances to buy that, you know, clean car. And for a boiler is even less. You probably have one chance to replace your boiler with the next technology. So we are under a lot of time constraints and we also only have so many opportunities to help people transition or make a choice that they otherwise might not make. I think your question about can we relax some of these constraints and kind of push forward? I don't think so. I guess I'm operating under the assumption that uh, I don't think so. Uh, I don't think we can relax, for example, the reliability constraint. I don't think anybody will 
tolerates, um, at least in this country, sort of significant blackouts, you know, because we want to conserve energy. Um, I don't think anybody will talk, well, I don't think enough people will tolerate having really expensive home heating bills <laughs> um, or not be able to afford home heating, for example. Uh, so the affordability metric is also a constraint that I don't know that we can really relax. Um, and then the time constraint, of course, is the climate change constraint. So I would say I'm operating under the assumption that we can't quite relax these constraints and we have to do everything we can to make the transition almost aligned and timely. And, and many of these transitions actually have to be aligned because we don't want to you know, for example, we don't want to transition everybody onto the electricity grid when the electricity grid can't handle it. Well, we don't yet have, you know, right now Massachusetts doesn't have one single megawatt of offshore wind. You know, we have a lot more solar now and you see them on uh, people's rooftops, but we have to kind of time these things quite well. Um, so I would think that no, uh, unfortunately, I don't know we have the luxury of relaxing these constraints to full, move forward. I think from a politics perspective though, um, we may need other ways to pay for these transitions. Uh, so the way I think about it, you know, in the policy arena, it's like you have only a few ways to pay for these things. One is a user's pay, um, you know, I want a new heating system and I will pay and I'm willing to pay more or or just get the new technology. And then there is the uh, rate payers pay. So either the gas utility rate payers or electric rate payers pay. And Massachusetts have actually used quite a bit of leeway in that to make sure we help pay for everyone's energy efficient um, buildings. So we use what we call a mass save program that uh, basically charges all electric and gas rate payers some smaller amounts that helps pay for insulations, uh, changing of uh, windows um, to make sure that the, the buildings can be improved from an efficiency perspective. So there's a rate payers pay. And then the last one is taxpayers pay. And there are examples in Europe uh, from a climate resiliency perspective where, you know, you kind of charge everybody a little bit to pay for, to pay for um, the transformation or in the resilience side of things to pay for climate damages. So I think in some ways, there are only three ways of paying for this. <laughs> yeah, well, I, oh, some people might argue that there is a fourth one, which is that uh, the federal taxpayer uh, yes. uh, shoulders some of the um, burden. Um, I'm going to, these are two questions that I know you probably knew you were going to get, so I will, I will throw them at you. Uh, talk for a minute about one of the challenges, which is I think we've got what three million residences in Massachusetts, um, and you have a program where you were going to convert a hundred thousand to electric, uh, heat, uh, basically heat pumps, um, and I think you did four hundred and twenty-six or something like that. Um, <laughs> and you know, you look at this and you go, "Well, gosh, um, we don't have a lot of um, uh, one uh, capacity to deliver heat pumps at the moment." Number two, this is a northern climate. If I lived in Georgia, um, my air conditioning and heating loads were pretty close to one to one ratio. Here it's like three to one in favor of heat. Uh, and so, you know, talk a little bit about, um, you know, how are you going to, to implement something like this down the road? I realize you set up a, what I always tell my students, when you can't answer the problem, set up a committee, um, which, um, <laughs> But how are we going to, in an affordable way, uh, convert uh, 3 million homes 
off of fossil fuels to, to basically electricity, which right now looks like heat pumps. When you have to redo the duct work in at least half of them, no, that's a very good question. And yes, there is press release, uh, press out there saying that we're not converting buildings fast enough. Um, so I do have a mental image of how this would work. First, the hybrid use of heat pumps are already cost effective today. And it turns out to my surprise, I thought I was the only one that has a house that doesn't have central air conditioning because it seems like everybody else does. I live in by the coastal area, so we don't need air conditioning except for a few days of the year. So we don't have central AC. Um, but it turns out a lot of buildings don't have, a lot of homes don't have central AC. And, but more and more homes are acquiring AC. And I think that's an opportunity for us to start educating people to, instead of you buying a central AC that only acts like an AC, you buy a heat pump that can provide AC as well as heating down efficiently down to say freezing point. Um, and I think this, what many experts have called this hybrid system, which means you use your uh, heat pump down to a certain temperature, and then you still have a backup fuel, which in this case is natural gas or oil heating. And I do think in the short term, that's probably a solution that we need to capture because it's already cost effective. People are already installing these things and we can probably capture the market for AC. So those are in the market for ACs, they can buy a heat pump and that heat pump can provide significant um, heating uh, resources as well. Um, there's an education piece, not only consumer education, but workforce education. It turns out installation of heat pump is much more expensive in Massachusetts than Maine. And that increases the cost to consumers. So we actually have a lot of work in just educating both consumers and the workforce. And I do think eventually we need to get to as the, the slides show, a sort of a net zero heating load from fossil fuel. But I think in this first decade, we must look at the opportunities that these hybrid heat pump can bring us. Um, the other thing we're doing a lot of analyses on is, what does this mean? I, I think my, my fear, and it's not resolved yet, is if we just use hybrid heat pumps for homes and then they transition to natural gas for the last, you know, the coldest days, we actually are not taking off much load off natural gas. We might take off some of the emissions because we're not consuming as much natural gas as we used to. We're not offloading the system, which means we continue have to invest, kept making capital investments in our gas system. So we're doing some analyses to see how big of an issue that is, um, because I don't think it's acceptable for us to continue to invest in a natural gas system and an electric system simultaneously, because that way we're actually, if we do that, then we are increasing the cost on both systems and those that are left on the natural gas system actually have to pay a huge price for natural gas. So uh, I'm actually adding more complication to your question, but, no, but I, I, I hear you. I think the transition has to be sort of, we have to have a short term and then we have to have a long-term strategy. Well, I think that, uh, I think your, your, your comment is, is right on. Um, I think the other constraint you're gonna have to live with a bit is that, um, you don't want to take actions now that look good, but uh, preclude you from doing other things in the 2030 to 2050 period. Yes. You almost want to make sure you can accelerate the deployment in the, the latter years and, and not find yourself constrained by the decisions you made in the earlier years. Yes. Um, the other question that, again, you, I'm probably sure you had to expect, but I've got about four of them. Uh, which is the Globe article this morning uh, on the natural gas. Uh, the question is, uh, I think that my figures are correct, that, that the uh, gas companies 
uh, are trying have a lot of leaky uh, lines. They're not that dangerous in most cases, but they are leaking. Um, and that the uh, there is a program, I believe, passed by the legislature that says you got to upgrade all those lines. And the cost figure that was in the paper today was around twenty billion dollars. And people said, well, wait a minute, we don't want to have a lot of natural gas here 20 years from now. Why are we making investments to put in infrastructure that's going to last 40 to 60 years when we want this out in 20 years? And couldn't we use this 20 billion a lot more effectively for uh, more less carbon intensive options? What's your reaction to that article? Well, first of all, I think we need to check the numbers um, because I think the entire rate base uh, doesn't exceed the 20 billion by much. So something is not quite right on the numbers. Uh, but aside from that, I do think, you know, it boils down to we can't, we can't have leaky gas systems, right? For safety reasons, we can't have very leaky gases and in addition to the greenhouse gas that it leaks. Um, so we have to maintain <laughs> our gas systems what, if they're still in use, period. Just like your reliability constraint, we can't have a leaky gas system if we're gonna use it. So the way to think about this, and I believe the gas utilities are beginning to think this way in their analyses, uh, we have a, a regulatory proceeding that asked the gas utilities to, to present and to propose what kind of regulatory treatment they might need as we transition away from natural use of natural gas. So, so we haven't peaked yet in Massachusetts and New England. Our natural gas usage is actually still increasing. So we haven't even peaked on our natural gas and coming down yet. As we come down, because we have to, to, to reduce emissions, as we come down the sort of natural gas usage consumption uh, curve, how do, we, how do we maintain the system? <laughs> how do we, so I think this is a challenging, and I think there are some questions and answers for the gas utilities who really are the ones that know their system the best. Are there ways to kind of retire certain parts of the system. I think to do this in a sort of piece by piece retirement is probably the most logical ways without getting into the technical challenge, technical uh, details of this. I think the gas utilities are beginning to think this way, to think about, okay, obviously it's related to the issue I just talked about. Like if we need natural gas for the coldest day, Right, we can get off natural gas until the coldest day, and we still all need our natural gas. That's not going to work because we will need to invest in that capital struck capital or all the pipes, hundred percent, like like we're using it every day. So I don't think that system will work because that cost of that last unit of gas is going to be so expensive. Um, so we have to start thinking about which portions of the network, the gas system, the gas pipeline, we will st start retiring. Um, and that's, you know, that's, it has a technical component to this, but there's also a regulatory component. Like how do we, how do we deal with that from a regulatory uh, fin finance perspective? Oh, that's a, a going to be a, a huge problem because if you want to get off gas by 2050, you got to start weaning yourself of this. Uh, probably exactly. by 2030, you've got to have a real plan, and uh, that's a huge stranded asset if you uh, potential uh, out yeah. there. And there's a lot of people on the environmental side who say that you know we should begin to wean now. Uh, we had the whole debate over the Salem facility. Uh, which was to be a gas facility. And uh, I worked out a thing where they were, going to, they were going to be there for a few years. And then they were after 10 or 15 years are gonna um, either um, move to something else or retire. Um, yeah. There's one other issue that a couple of people have asked questions about, which is if you read um, the report you did in 2019, uh, there's a provision you have sort of uh, uh, four pillars on that report, a little bit different than the pillars you got today. And one of them was uh, basically taking carbon out of the air. Um, 
And uh, some people say, well, that'd be great if we could, but we're not close on that technology yet. Uh, yet it was one of the four main things in the 2019 report. What are your thoughts about uh, uh, air removal of, car of, of uh, greenhouse gases? Yeah, I, I have to admit, I'm not a technology expert when it comes to that. Uh, I've been trying to, you know, learn more about it. So at this moment, the state's efforts are uh, doing it some sort of detailed accounting of what we actually have even capabilities to, to store in Massachusetts and to start thinking about what kind of national or maybe even international storage um, capabilities there would be, or we might have to join into a national uh, sort of credit system of some sort. Uh, we're not close to getting to a solution yet. Um, I do, I have uh, listened to some of the experts on carbon sequestration. I understand that um, we need that technology. We have to be able to take, uh, to get to net zero, we have to be able to uh, capture and sequester. And I think most of the work in Massachusetts right now is, uh, you know, I'm not uh, on the technology side and we're not at the state level, we're not really working on the technology side, but to actually just to understand what our working natural lands can capture. And also uh, how much can we capture if we green our spaces, right? So the, if um, Massachusetts actually made up with quite a bit of forest, forest land uh, and farmland, but forest land, if we can increase the capability to to sequester through forestry, um, that's something that our agency is working on. Okay, I have one last question, which is the one I've saved for myself. I've been asking other questions, which is, you know, there's a heavy reliance on your plan of renewables. There's a huge reliance on offshore wind. Um, uh, the average capacity factor for renewables uh, uh, overall in the United States is 40%. Uh, offshore wind uh, is very variable. It can be as high as, you know, if you build everything you intend, you could be 55, 60% some days and 30% the next day. Uh, so you have this whole intermittent problem. Uh, how are you going to deal with this intermittency uh, in a world that is primarily reliant on renewables? Yeah, well, our 2050 decarbonization roadmap actually lays out this topic uh, in a pretty detailed way where we look at days that it's very cloudy and no wind. And we show that, and, and you can have multiple days in a row. And in those days, we actually will need our gas generators or that's assuming we don't have enough storage to have long duration storage. We have some long duration storage today with hydro facilities and pumped hydro, but we don't really have the technology right now for long duration storage that's cost effective. Um, so in on those stretches of days, we will still need our gas generation, which is why, you know, that 15 percent, it's not just the uh, gas heating that we can't get out of the buildings, but it also includes some gas generation that we we will need on those sort of non-sunny and non-windy days. Um, but essentially, we need to balance the system with between storage and gas units. Uh, from an electricity perspective, that's I I can't think of any other ways to really balance the electricity system, but that's. I think we are approaching it that way. We are asking and through incentives, uh, solar generation to be paired with storage. And you'll see probably in the Western part of the U US, most of the solar projects are also paired with storage. So, but you're looking at extremely expensive gas then in, in that scenario. Extremely expensive in the sense that all of the capital costs will have to be uh, recovered through those short, uh, short time periods of usage. Yes, and I'm hoping, and I know that the existing gas generators were pretty happy with that study. 
I am hoping that the most efficient gas generators today um, will probably remain on the system to provide, um, I'll say, backup or reliability services of the future. So, well, I want to thank you. This has been a, a tour de force of, uh, or a journey across many issues. Um, I uh, really uh, want to say that we're all very grateful for the work you're doing. Uh, it is hard uh, and it is challenging. Um, I hope uh, that uh, uh, over time you can hire some of our students because I am sure they will help you in that challenge. Uh, but this is terrific and thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Um, I want to also say to everybody, again, there's no seminar next week. Uh, Jonas Meckling uh, will be here on the two weeks from today. And so I hope you will join us. And again, please join me in thanking Judy for a terrific presentation. Thank you so much. And I hope the next time I uh, do this, I can be in person and see everybody's faces. Thank you very also much for having me. We. Thank you very much. Thank Bye. you. Take care. Bye.